One of the things I find very interesting about emergency response work is that all the professions are inherently hazardous. But the professions have responded. When we recognize the hazard, we train and equip our people to manage it. And we see a reduction in the danger. We see a reduction in the line of duty deaths associated right. with things like um, shootings, with bloodborne pathogens, needle sticks, fires, running out of air inside. Yet, the biggest exposure, the most chronic exposure we have over the courses of our career are the mental and emotional exposures we get from waiting through other people's trauma. Nobody ever calls 911 to say, hey, I'm having a great day. Why don't you come join me in <laughs> I'm celebration? I'm sure there are people that have, but probably not as a whole. <laughs> yeah, not as a whole. Um, so I was really struck by the fact that all of these occupations, law enforcement, fire, EMS, dispatch, and so many others, we are expected to work in an immersion environment, other people's trauma, other people's emotional stress and tragedy, yet we are not given the tools to equip ourselves to understand that the traits that made us good for our profession, right. the things like compassion and empathy, that desire to help others, are also pathways for injury to us when we don't know how to recognize that, when we don't know how to honor that, and we don't know how to heal ourselves from that. The other really interesting point I find is not only are we working in this environment, completely unequipped to deal with the mental and emotional stressors, but the cultures around each of those environments are such that any discussion of me mental or emotional impact from the job is viewed as a sign of weakness. Hi there, thank you for joining the Communities Connected podcast. I'm your host, Jason Hopkins, founder and president of The Connection Project and CEO and president of NAMI Arapaho Douglas Counties. The Connection Project began with a single goal, to convene communities for conversations that matter. Real people, real life together. Today my guest is Rhonda Kelly. Rhonda and I were destined to meet. Repeatedly I would have a meeting with someone else and they would ask if I knew her. After a few times I took a hint and reached out. From our first meeting we quickly recognized the intersections of our respective work. Rhonda has an impressive list of professional accomplishments. She's been a firefighter, paramedic, emergency and psychological nurse, and also an oceanographer. Any one of those careers is impressive and admirable, and each role makes her uniquely qualified for her current position. Any one of those careers is impressive and admirable, yet each role makes her uniquely qualified for her current passion. Rhonda leads Responder Strong, which is an organization focused on developing better mental health supports for responders and their families. Over the past several years, suicide has been recognized as a leading occupational killer of law enforcement, fire, and EMS. Her work is responder-driven and works across branches connecting groups that have been previously siloed. Rhonda, welcome. So glad to have you here today. Thanks, Jason. How I'm are really you? happy to be here. Good. Thank you. So, wow, you've done a lot in your career. It's been a little bit of a random progression, but Absolutely. it's been good. Enjoyable. So, so tell us how you got here. I mean, obviously you have a, a list of impressive uh, accomplishments, but... Um, what led you to this place that you're at today? Well, it's an interesting intersection, as you had pointed out, of seemingly different occupations on the surface. Moving from research and oceanography, working in the Antarctic on research vessels for several years, that's where I happen to be trained as a hazardous materials technician and as an emergency medical technician. And as I started to get closer to 30 and thought I should get an adult job and come back to the U.S., I came back thinking I was going to be a nurse or a PA. While I was shadowing them, though, in ERs, I continued to see firefighter paramedics come in. This was a profession that hadn't even been on my radar in the past, but I saw a lot of similarities. It's crew-based. It is an unusual and unique schedule. It's an unusual and unique working environment. No two days are the same, and it's challenging. It requires the competency and a variety of skills. It's, it's, uh, it seemed very appealing to me. So I jumped ship proverbially then, started testing for the fire departments, and became a firefighter paramedic for Aurora Fire here in Colorado. Uh, as the years went on, I decided to go ahead and continue pursuing nursing, picked up my nursing license, and started to work on the side in Porter Adventist ER and psychological ER. Part of my interest in transitioning to that side of things was I had been, oh, five or six years into my career at that point, and I had noticed that there were changes in my coworkers, there were changes in me, that the profession really had an impact on people that no one had discussed, no one had warned us about. So when I was thinking, well, what's bothering me? And one of the things was I, I wanted to feel like I was accomplishing something. Right. 
And I think most responders come in with a very high sense of personal efficacy. If you ask any responder why they do what they do, the answer is invariably some version of I want to help people. Right. So I realized I was starting to feel disempowered. I felt like there were certain patients who relied on us because they were poorly resourced. 911's the easy button. They'd come to us, which is great, but a ride to the ER in an ambulance isn't what would solve their problems. Sure. So in my mind, I thought, well, if I start working in the ER, I'm going to find ways to improve my care on the other side of the doors, that I'll make a bigger difference. And I started to realize that's, that's not true either. There's a whole multitude of factors at play here. Uh, shortly after that, I guess it was about two years later, the health and safety officer job came open in my department and I got really excited. I realized this was my opportunity to work with 350 people I knew with whom I'd already established a rapport and who I felt a connection that I could help make their lives better and in turn they would make their family lives better and ripple throughout their community. I spent five years, the last five years of my career in that role. Mm -hmm. It was fantastic. During that time, I happened to meet Matt Vogel, who was assistant director of the National Center for Depression at CU Anschutz. He was very interested in working with firefighters and asked me what we needed. This was back in 2012. Okay. I told him what we need is to recognize that suicide's our leading occupational killer. We know it, but we're not talking about it. Right. And to expand upon that concept, we need to stop working in silos, not only within our own institution, our own agency, but within our own branch, because all emergency response branches are suffering with the same mental and emotional impacts due to the work. He thought it was a great idea, had no idea how to fund it at the time, but he went on to create the National Mental Health Innovation Center right. at CU Anschutz also. Several years later, he gave me a call, said, I think we can take the conversation to a different level. We started working on the feasibility and the concept, gathering together local responders and clinicians in the metro area, talking about, could we do this? Could we work together? What would we want it to look like? We started in August of 2016 now okay. with 35 members. We now have more than 560 members, wow. most of whom are in Colorado. Many are scattered across the country. And we've accomplished quite a, a lot. In fact, we hit the ground running so quickly that by February of 2017, Matt gave me the, the option to leave the fire department and work full time for Responder Strong. Great. So that's what we're doing. Working so to nobody's ever called you an overachiever, right? <laughs> You take on the big projects like I do. Ah, it's energizing. It and is energizing and exhausting. It is, it is. But I, and that's one of the points that really resonated with me about your work is the energy comes from establishing those connections. Right. They're there, they're often latent, and when you bring them to the surface, wow, it's a well, whole new level. So what I had mentioned is, you know, people kept telling me, you got to meet Rhonda, you got to meet Rhonda. And when we finally reached out, I think the thing we both recognized quickly is you know, the core of our work is about building connections with people. Absolutely. And you and I are both pretty connected people, you in different ways than I am, and, and there are some definite intersections there. You had mentioned something a minute ago that I want to go back to, that when you were doing your work as, as a firefighter and, and paramedic, um, you had recognized changes in your coworkers and, and within yourself. Talk to me a little bit about what are the things that you were recognizing in, in your core group of people mm. you were working with that teed this work up? Well, it's... One of the things I find very interesting about emergency response work is that all the professions are inherently hazardous, but the professions have responded. When we recognize the hazard, we train and equip our people to manage it, and we see a reduction in the danger. We see a reduction in the line of duty deaths associated right. with things like um, shootings, with bloodborne pathogens, needle sticks, fires, running out of air inside. Yet, the biggest exposure, the most chronic exposure we have over the courses of our career are the mental and emotional exposures we get from waiting through other people's trauma. Nobody ever calls 911 to say, hey, I'm having a great day. Why don't you come join me in <laughs> I'm celebration? I'm sure there are people that have, but probably not as a whole. <laughs> yeah, not as a whole. Um, so I was really struck by the fact that all of these occupations, law enforcement, fire, EMS, dispatch, and so many others, we are expected to work in an immersion environment, other people's trauma, other people's emotional stress and tragedy, yet we are not given the tools to equip ourselves to understand that the traits that made us good for our profession, right. that things like compassion and empathy, that desire to help others, are also pathways for injury to us when we don't know how to recognize that, when we don't know how to honor that, and we don't know how to heal ourselves from that. The other really interesting point I find is not only are we working in this environment, completely unequipped to deal with the mental and emotional stressors, 
but the cultures around each of those environments are such that any discussion of men mental or emotional impact from the job is viewed as a sign of weakness. Well, really, it's a it's a, a role that you're pretty much trained to be invulnerable because you're in dangerous situations and being reactive is not necessarily as good as being responsive. But what I have found in the work we've done with crisis intervention team um, with the police department, sheriff's departments, are we're act, asking people to be more empathetic in their roles when really their training is kind of the antithesis of that. Exactly. What we're taught to do is exactly what you said, to go in, to not react, to respond to the scene, do what needs to be done, and then to get back out. In order to do that, you right. oftentimes have to compartmentalize your horror, your grief, um, your sorrow, your anger, your any intense emotional reaction to the scene which we understand that in our work. You need right. to compartmentalize that, but nobody ever teaches us that you can't just compartmentalize it forever. Right. Sooner or later, if you don't pull that stuff out and manage it and deal with it, because your reactions are normal, you are going to sustain what's now recognized as a stress injury. And in fact, stress is the most chronic exposure we have on the job. Right. And it's all, the most likely injury we are to sustain over the course of our careers. In fact, I'd go so far as to say nobody escapes unscathed from that. I, I can't imagine that, we, that, that they would. So what I'm taking away from this conversation is really from the beginning, there are no real tools or training that effectively help people navigate what they're gonna experience in real world on the job experience. Yes, and I think the excuse for that or the the reasoning, quote unquote, behind that was just exactly what you alluded to. If you're not tough enough to be in the job, you don't belong here. We right. only hire a certain caliber of people. And I think one of the aspects of our culture that has been most damaging is the whole superhero mythology. Right. That you are expected just to come into this job fully equipped to deal with this hazard that you weren't informed about, to do it in the absence of any support, and to do it in the face of ridicule when you're failing to deal with it effectively. Wow, what a recipe for disaster and for failure. So I really, when we, when Responder Strong, we put our, our information out, we talk a lot about the superhero mythology and how damaging that is, that when you are held up to this standard that's not humanly attainable and you're not supported at all in it, you, you're, you're held let accountable, me. really. Accountable, yeah. And when we look at the superheroes in the media, you look at them, they're dark, brooding, isolated, struggling to reconcile different identities, you know, the home life, the career life. And it's, it's a miserable existence. That's not something we should push our people to, to strive for. And our, our culture has, over time, evolved to be one that almost honors the signs of stress injury, right. that being angry, being callous, um, perhaps having a drinking problem, they're considered being salty. It's considered being confident. It's considered being seasoned. So it's almost celebrated. Yes, exactly, which is another barrier to individuals right. reaching out and saying, hey, I'm really struggling, that bothered me. So what you recognized, and, and is it fair to say that, that emergency responders are struggling, whether they admit it or not? Oh, I think if we look at the statistics, there's no question. Right. We know that suicide is underreported among emergency responders. It's very poorly tracked. Most estimates are that we're capturing about 40% of the actual occurrence of suicide. Wow. Yeah, uh, for all these reasons, the stigma. And, and sometimes it's well-intentioned not to admit it, but it's, it's damaging. It just persists in, in building that stigma even further. Now we recognize that police and fire are three times more likely to die by their own hand than by all the, all the other line of duty death causes combined. Wow. So it's, it's truly the hazard we never prepared for, and it's the one that we've, we've been burying our head in the sand about forever. When we look at the other branches, dispatch doesn't really track suicides amongst their ranks, but you look in the dispatch community, they are the first of the first responders. Right, they're probably hearing some of the worst of it. They are hearing most of the worst of it, and they're in a seated position. They're in a position that they encounter all of the sympathetic nervous system stimulation, all of the stress responses, but they have no physical outlet for it. They have to sit there, and in 10 seconds later, pick up the next call and keep rolling throughout the shift, oftentimes without a sense of closure, which erodes their sense of efficacy even more. We look at EMS. EMS has been traditionally very challenging to track any sort of mental health statistics with because of the variety of their, their embodiments. There are volunteer EMS agencies, private EMS agencies, municipal EMS agencies, and not no central organization that's really working to track, hey, what are our rates of depression, anxiety, suicide, um, There's really no abuse. standards for it. 
No, exactly. When I look around for statistics, uh, SAMHSA, the Substance Abuse Mental Health Administration, sure. estimates that 40% of EMS and fire in the U.S. have a substance misuse issue. And that's been a really critical topic of conversation amongst our group and that we want leaders, we want families, and we want responders themselves to understand substance misuse in this field is quite often a, a failed attempt to cope with trauma. Correct. It's not a character flaw as it's often viewed as. It's not a disciplinary issue. This is someone who is really struggling and hasn't been equipped with any other mechanisms. Right. That this is the easiest mechanism to numb, whether it's uh, alcohol or taking narcotics out of the narc kits from the med kits. So really, Responder Strong has stepped in in the middle of chaos, so to speak. Yes. So tell me about your work there. I know you have started this in 2016, it sounds like, um, and have made a lot of progress in the time that you've done that. At, Tell us what we should know about Responder Strong and what you guys are doing to address the challenges. There are a couple unique facets of our approach. One is that we work across branch boundaries. We recognize we have the twofold problem. The exposure is the same in all these branches and the cultures are the same, that they do not allow individuals to come forward and say, I'm struggling with this right. mentally or emotionally. Another aspect is that we are responder led, responder informed and responder driven. We have tapped into this undercurrent of passion and motivation amongst responders who've been working siloed in their own agencies, feeling like they weren't supported and feeling like they they, they weren't having the efficacy they wanted in that realm. So we've very much been an, an organization that's founded on connection. Where our, our progress has come from, and, and I'm grateful to see how much progress we've made just in the past two years, it's all because we're connecting people and the synergy that comes out of those those partnerships and those developing relationships. That's amazing work. It's It's been... Yeah, it's been very rewarding. Um, one of the other things that I think is really good for us is that we have always been additive, not competitive. We know there are a lot of good underutilized resources out there because there's been an absence of a, a vetted, broad network to connect these. Responders often, like many populations, don't reach out until they're in crisis. Right. And at that point, Siri and Google aren't going to find you what you, what you need, most likely. As so, much as we want them to. Yes, exactly. So we're working to establish a, a vetted network of crisis resources, and also to provide the education and the empowerment for responders to recognize when they're sliding towards that red end of the stress injury spectrum and to bring themselves back with their own personal practices. So you all are really a hub for education, training, and resources. Exactly. Okay. So how well, I can't imagine this was immediately just welcomed with open arms in everywhere you've gone. How, no. how has this been received in the communities that you work in? It varies. Uh, I think we are moving in the right direction. I think we are hitting a, an optimal window for this. We've known that substance abuse, depression, anxiety, suicide are leading problems for long enough that it's now a topic of national discussion among chiefs, among unions, among line members. And I think people are hungry for change. It used to be just acknowledge that when you went out, you, you might have a couple divorces, you probably have financial issues, you might drink too much, you might be a little angry and bitter, your personality might have shifted a little bit. Right. And that was just accepted. And I see, especially with the new people coming into the field, they're not willing to accept that anymore, and I don't think they should. So I think that's very much to our advantage. And I think I'll, not to cut you off, no, but go ahead. one of the other ways that I think we've been successful in our, our efforts so far to change our culture is that Responder Strong is composed of responders, so we're able to come from inside the organizations to open the correct doors, to start the right conversations, and to, to start to influence leadership to move along with us. I think that's amazing work, and, and I admire you for doing that. Thank you for taking it on. So I, I, I want to I stay stuck on this track because I know um, often first responders get a bad rap. You know, we, we hear on the news something's happened, and you know, we're, we're quick to vilify police or some, some emergency responder um, and to make them the bad guys and not saying that sometimes they are not because I know that's true. What, what should people listening know um, about that community that, um, that maybe they don't have context for when we hear bad stories in the media? Ah, 
I think one of the key things that we want people to understand is the motivation for emergency responders. As I'd alluded to earlier, you ask any responder why they got into the work that they're doing, why they're making such tremendous personal sacrifices to do this work, it is invariably some version of, I'm here to help people. Right. So that is the motivation. We all know situations can get out of control, they can become very volatile, and that Monday morning quarterbacking or after the fact can portray a very different circumstance than what the individuals were engaged at the, right. at the time. So I think part of it is understanding that most responders are coming from a very good place and to also understand that things aren't always what they appear, right. that there are, there are facts and there are contributing factors that might not be readily visible in the, the first brush of media coverage or news coverage or social media coverage in particular. I also think that one of the messages we want people to understand is that Law enforcement, fire, EMS, dispatch, they're all just regular human people. They have right. all the stressors, all the strains that everybody else does in life, and they've stepped forward to shoulder as best they can the stresses and the strains of others and to help where they can. Well, and I think you teed that up perfectly because I think the thing that's missing in this is maybe as walk-a-day humans, we hold emergency responders to a different standard just for the roles that they serve as a more empowered standard or um, an enforcer of something that I think sometimes we, as, as just normal walk-a-day folks, forget they're human. Exactly. You and know, it's really easy for us to make them the bad guys when, you know, when we're in crisis, who do you call? Exactly. So, you know, I, I have experienced in my own work just being able to step back and say, gosh, what must that look like? that everything you're going into potentially could turn into a dangerous or violent or unfortunate a best situation. And I can't imagine the pressure of a job like that. No. Well, especially as you alluded to earlier with law enforcement, you never know how you're going to be received. You don't know if you're walking into a potentially lethal situation. Right. Um, you don't know what anyone else's intentions are. And you're really there to sort out and do the right thing but you also have to make split second decisions. Well, and you're hypervigilant all the yes. time. So I imagine the pressure from that hypervigilance really does take a toll, not to mention the trauma. Just, just being on or on guard all the time um, has to make a huge impact on one's mental health. Exactly, and I love that you bring that up. Hypervigilance has become or is recognized as one of the signs of stress injury formation. Stress injury was created by the military, recognized as a, as a process that quite frequently occurs in soldiers, very much so does in other high risk, high, high, um, high risk, high, um, okay, high risk occupations. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> but um, one of the things we talk about is the physiological impacts of the job and how those can impact our relationships when they're not recognized for what they truly are. In particular, parasympathetic nervous system backlash. When you're on a full shift, you're on all the time, you're listening to the tones, you're going on the calls, you constantly have the cortisol and the adrenaline, the heart rate accelerating, the blood pressure up. That's not a, an unlimited resource. Oftentimes when responders return home at the end of a shift, however long it was, they find that the sympathetic nervous system's more or less tapped out and the parasympathetic system's taking the lead. It's no longer in homeostasis. Gotcha. So what that is, is recovery. What it looks like is lethargy and disinterest. Um, things that can easily become the root of problems in relationships mm -hmm. when all it is is physiologic the body is trying, the mind is trying to recover from the taxing shift right. beforehand. And that can also be cumulative. One of the things we find is that a lot of emergency responders pick up secondary jobs for a multitude of reasons. Most often those jobs are in the same field. So now not only is the responder doubling his or her exposure time to trauma and all the stressors of the job, but they're, they're having their recovery time. And that can have catastrophic consequences if we don't recognize it. And, and I think we all it. need downtime. We do, absolutely. Whether you're in a stressful job or not, we all need downtime to mm -hmm. recharge. Right, exactly. And I think that's another aspect of our culture is that our culture, subtly or not so subtly, vilifies self-care, that that right. is for the weak. You put everybody else's oxygen mask on before you put your, your own on, and that's not sustainable. Self-care is a better way to, to perform in your job. It's a better way to support those people around you. So what do you think a, a more perfect world looks like in, in the work that you're doing? I know you've got some future mapping that you're working on. Where do you imagine we go from here? And ha have we really shifted perceptions in the work that you're doing? We've started the shift. Okay. We have a long way to go. I believe that when we start to incorporate, and many of the more progressive agencies are, 
um, awareness training in academies for internal scene size up rather than just the external world, uh, recognizing where we are, how we're functioning, recognizing what the signs of a stress injury are, empowering people to bring themselves back into that green zone, getting people to understand that hypervigilance doesn't make you better. In right. fact, it exhausts you and maybe makes you react a little more rapidly to things than, right. than you need to. Um, so it, the education, the empowerment piece, I think we need to start that at the beginning of the career. That's one of the programs we're very, very proud of is a curriculum project we created for the community college system here in Colorado. Okay. We know that the community colleges train about half the first responders in Colorado and particularly in the, the rural communities that don't have freestanding agencies, they train a lot of the emergency responders. So we approached them and said we'd like to do a curriculum enhancement that's specific for each of the four branches that talks about the statistics, mm -hmm. that talks about the hazards, mental and, mental and emotional, in the work, and talks about ways to improve self-care and to prevent these from occurring. We have been doing pre and post assessments with the students. We do show a significant measurable improvement in the level of knowledge. Right. And we really think that's the way. If we want to change our culture, we have to change the minds of those who are coming in so that they recognize a stress injury is no different than a broken leg. In fact, you're far more likely to have a stress injury than a broken leg. Um, we need to recruce, reduce the stigma. If I broke my leg on the fire ground, I'd be transported to the hospital, my leg right. would be treated, my duty status would be shifted and altered to do things that I could with the broken leg until I healed, and then after the appropriate rehab, I'd be back online. Nobody would ever come up to me and say, Rhonda, we just don't think you have the femurs for this work. Yeah. Um, yet we see that all the time with diagnoses of depression or anxiety or DUI. People are shunned and uh, scorned or ridiculed, and that decreases the connectivity. And there's probably punitive actions for a lot of those things, too. Exactly. So that that perpetuates the stress of not saying anything or reaching out for help, I'm guessing. Fear, absolutely. Yeah. And it's ironic that in our communities, which are so tribal and so tight-knit, the fear of being excluded is is near the top of the, the worst fears list, right. yet in an attempt to prevent from losing that connection, we isolate and we start to hide what we're truly feeling, stop, feel, or stop presenting authentically, and in turn have physically maybe left ourselves in the community, but have withdrawn from it mentally and emotionally. And that's where a lot of the injury that results. That's a lot to unpack. It is, I know, we can't do this in I half mean, hour. But <laughs> I, I am amazed at the work that you're doing. I think it's phenomenal. So. Walk me through what's an average week like for you. What are what are you what are you focused on doing with all of the things you've got going on that you think is making the greatest impact and is something you should be doing more of and are doing more of? Well, and I think Responder Strong Success, I know this, doesn't come from me. It comes from our volunteers, from our members. Right. I, I've categorized myself as a switchboard operator to you in the past, <laughs> and I very much feel like that's what I do, is right. that I'm the networker. I have the, the pleasure and the opportunity to talk to a lot of people, whether they are clinicians, whether they are chiefs or sheriffs, peer support members, line personnel who are doing great work to understand, to listen to what they're doing and find ways to support them in that, whether that's Responder Strong supporting them or pushing them out to other partners who can help facilitate their work. We are really serving as both the platform okay. for these projects that are like-minded and working to improve mental health supports, and we're serving as the umbrella to bring everything together so that it's more accessible. Uh, that's really where a lot of our success has come from. So to get back to your question, a typical week, I do spend a lot of time meeting with people, on the phone with people, listening to what they're doing, sharing ways that we might be able to interweave with them, to interconnect with them. Um, we take calls, from, calls, emails, texts from emergency responders and from leaders asking mm -hmm. for help locating the appropriate resources for a situation. We, I, I would say the majority of my week is, is networking and coordinating. So I imagine that's a fairly busy schedule that you've got. I, I know it is. Um, how do you practice self-care? How do you take care of you? Because I'm, I'm guessing you're hearing a lot of stories um, that, that have an impact on you going through the course of your day. How do you take care of you? Ah, well, and your questioning brings to mind a specific population within the emergency response community, and that's the peer supporters. Mm -hmm. So if, for anybody who's not familiar with it, peer support is considered one of the most effective frontline recognition, prevention, empowerment, healing tools for 
the stresses and strains of the job in each of the branches. So okay. it's peers, it's individuals who are in the organization. They can be from a variety of backgrounds, a variety of current roles in the organization, but who have a particular passion for mental wellness among their peers and really understand it. Okay. Get the humor, get the coping mechanisms, understand the exposures, and understand that it is important to maintain confidentiality to quell some of those fears that individuals have, rightfully so, and also to maintain a non-judgmental place, to be a safe space. What I hear from peers and from what I experienced in myself when I was on the peer support team is that it is challenging to listen to the stresses and strains of your, your coworkers, your friends, and that it can actually add another layer of stress and strain. I can only imagine. Yes. So, um, recently, we were very pleased to uh, participate in a Resilient Mind workshop from Rich Gerling of the Mindful Badge Initiative, mm -hmm. who started working with law enforcement teaching mindfulness practices, not only to improve policing, but to integrate into self-care, to improve the, the overall quality of law enforcement officers' lives. He's expanded that um, training to emergency responders overall, and that's one of the big platforms that we've been advocating to responders is that mindfulness practices, which doesn't mean that you need yoga pants and incense and a candle, <laughs> but there are many, many ways to do it, just sure. to engage the mind, to shut down the voices, to shut down the negativity and the criticism. We know as humans, we all have a negativity bias. It's a survival instinct. In responders, that is finely honed out of necessity. Right. But um, when turned inward, it can also also be the most destructive force in an individual's life and their mental wellness. So for myself, I practice meditation, mm -hmm. uh, time outdoors. It's Colorado, it's a shame not to get outside <laughs> into the mountains, backcountry trips, maintaining social connections, positive reading, good friendships. Um, and it's, uh, I think I try to practice what we preach for everybody is to have a big toolbox for right. resiliency practices so that when one isn't available or one doesn't seem to be as effective as it used to be, there's others to you put in You have something else to fall back exactly. on. Exactly. Yeah, yeah I, um, I think it's, it, again, I think the work you're doing is so important and valuable. I really admire that you're, you're doing this and taking this on. Um, and I'm grateful to hear that you're taking care of yourself along the way. That's, that's important. Is there anything else that we should know before we wrap up today? Ah. That's a loaded question. There's tons to, <laughs> tons to talk about. I think um, the big message for any responders that are listening is just that we're out there. Um, we get it. Right. We are working to improve mental health supports for responders. One of the things that I think has been damaging to responders and, and has been part of the stigma that has been created in our culture and in our minds is that in the past, the only training we got about mental wellness was actually mental illness, and it was recognizing crisis situations and citizens so we could better help them. Oh. And it's been a big disservice to responders that in the past, our training conveyed um, mental wellness as you're either whole and healthy or you are in Sick. this crisis mode and that it didn't allow for the spectrum, the very rich spectrum of human experience in right. between. And to get responders to understand, no, there's, there's a whole spectrum of experiences. Blocking your emotions isn't going to work in the long run. We can't do that. That's not the way we're <laughs> wired. And that, um, that there are resources out there. And uh, yeah, basically. So long story short, you're not alone. Right, exactly. Yeah. The, and, and to wrap it back around to the connection, um, looking at the statistics, we teach to uh, um, recruit academies. Thomas Joyner out of the University of Southern Florida does a lot of research, and he mm -hmm. recently did a study among firefighters showing that I think it was 49% have admitted to suicidal ideation at some point during their career. Wow. Somewhere around 20% had actually made a plan. 15% had attempted. So we show those statistics to the recruits and then put numbers next to them and ask them what are those numbers. So there's usually a wide range of guesses. When we tell them that's those numbers translated to your agency, they realize, wow. And we really want to impress upon them. If you think somebody's struggling but you're afraid to reach out. They probably are. They probably are. If yeah. you think you're struggling and you're alone, you're not. <laughs> um, and that's really what we want to do is empower people to survive and thrive their career and to have a, an overall fulfilling life. They shouldn't pay for their service with their life in longevity right. or in quality. Well, thank you for shining your spotlight on this. Oh, and, and before we go, what's one thing you're grateful for today? Oh, well, this opportunity is the first thing well, to jump you, to mind. Well, thank you, likewise. <laughs> and uh, and uh, yeah, just for the beautiful weather today. Actually, the sun's <laughs> on my mind. It is a gorgeous day. <laughs> so, I love that we had this time together. Thank I you. I do too, thank you very much. Have a good day. You too.